material is constantly being transported along our shorelines. As waves break, run up the shore and return, they carry that material onshore and offshore. This is called littoral drift. Waves arrive at an angle to the shoreline and set up a longshore current, moving that littoral material parallel to the shore. Any type of structure which interrupts the flow can have undesirable effects. It is these structures that have lakeshore residents pointing the fingers of blame, mostly at the Army Corps of Engineers and their navigation jetties. In this area, we got the Corps of Engineers to blame because they shut the pier off and uh, they stopped the lateral flow of, of sand along here. High water would mean nothing to us if our material that uh, made up our shorelines were, were there in its place uh, where its natural state should be. Prior to 1930, these structures were porous. They allowed the littoral material to flow through them, unimpeded along the shoreline. But in the 1930s, these jetties were hardened with boulders, so this material wouldn't have to be dredged out of the channels as often. This impedes the longshore current and diverts the material lakeward, where it is difficult to get back into the shore zone. The ability of water to move this material also depends on its speed. High energy waves or fast moving currents can carry larger and heavier littoral drift, which keeps the material suspended in the water rather than depositing it along the lake shore. Hardened structures such as seawalls and jetties intensify a wave's energy, making it a destructive rather than a constructive force. Holmberg has been a frequent critic of the Corps for its failure to recognize this fact. By not recognizing how influential and uh, that these uh, structures are and how much damage they've cost is that it's going to be a hard one uh, to handle. But the Corps readily admits that 80 percent of their structures in the Great Lakes have had an impact on shoreline erosion. Uh, all these structures, uh, to some extent, have been identified as having impacted detrimentally, accelerating the erosion process within a certain distance of the structures. For example, the Army Corps estimates that the Federal Navigation Structure in South Haven causes 81 percent of the loss of the littoral material every year. Congress ordered the Corps to offset or mitigate the effect of these structures. So in the case of South Haven, nearly 5,000 truckloads of material is brought in every year from upland sources and placed just south of the harbor entrance along a three-quarter mile stretch of beach. This action should allow more of the littoral material to get back into the shore zone, an action that will have to be continued for years. Since the Army Corps is responsible only for public lands and not private property, that leaves lakeshore residents to fend for themselves. In our final report, we'll look at the options left to frustrated homeowners. I'm George Lessons, TV 13 Eyewitness News. This is the Rising Tides of Frustration, Part 5, for December 20th, 1985, and a lessons package. The beach in front of Dick Holmberg's Whitehall home is an example of erosion control success. Two years ago, waves were crashing less than 20 feet from his door. Today he has over 100 feet of reclaimed lakefront property. Holmberg is head of his own erosion control company and firmly believes the problem of controlling erosion stems from a lack of understanding. I think we have to work uh, towards educating people uh, uh, and especially our leaders that uh, they have to recognize the importance of this issue. Holmberg placed several concrete filled bags made of a super strong material just below the water line extending out into the lake. This low profile groin type system slows down the longshore current and dissipates the pounding waves allowing a buildup of sand. But for all the success his method has brought others an equal amount of failure. Take Donald Dempster of South Haven. Dempster has spent ten to fifteen thousand dollars over the past fifteen years on wooden seawalls and more recently on Holmberg's method. Still he has lost eighty feet of bluff. But when you've got an investment like a home you spend what you have to. Dempster and his neighbor Leo Mascarello are now only forty feet from disaster. Over the Labor Day weekend they filled fifty five gallon drums with cement and barricaded their shorelines. If these fail Mascarello says the prospect of saving their homes is dim. You're looking at fifty thousand dollars to move a house back. I don't know. Probably walk away from it. 
For 50000 I can erect a house in front of this one. This story is repeated many times up and down the lake shore. Some haven't been as fortunate. Two weeks ago, several homes in the Stickney Ridge area of Grand Haven fell victim to the latest storm. This Army Corps publication outlines several plans of action to combat erosion. But according to Holmberg, most are neither low in cost nor protect the shoreline. Some are even potential pollution hazards or even dangerous. Seawalls and bulkheads are usually installed as a last resort. These hardened structures intensify waves, speed up the longshore current, and carry away the building material. They often fail when water levels rise or are undermined by the waves. Riprap and broken up concrete, sometimes with protruding iron bars, are often used in revetments. A revetment breaks up a wave's action, but does little to slow down the longshore current. Even tires and 55-gallon drums from Origins Unknown are allowed by the Army Corps and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Holmberg says this should raise a yellow caution flag because nearly 50 communities get their drinking water from Lake Michigan. But there's little that homeowners cannot place in the water as long as a permit is granted. As long as the, uh, the applicant, uh, the individual applying for the permit is using a a construction technique that is valid and meaningful, that history has demonstrated it does the job, uh, uh, we, we really have to permit those types of structures. Residents who recently purchased federal flood insurance may be left high and dry in one sense. A spokesman for the Federal Insurance Administration says, claims for homes damaged or destroyed by erosion will probably be denied because erosion by normal wave action or heightened by a storm is an ongoing process and not a flooding of normally dry areas. But 4th District Congressman Mark Siljander is seeking to clarify the wording of the National Flood Insurance Program, plus he is pursuing tax credits for installation of erosion control devices and low interest loans to those who wish to install them. One last resort is a program administered by the state of Michigan. The Emergency Home Moving Loan Program provides a 3% interest rate subsidy to eligible homeowners. Many residents see this as retreating in defeat from a problem they didn't create. The controversy surrounding high lake water levels is far from over. Debate over what should and should not be done will rage on. But one thing is clear, any decision will have far-reaching and long-term consequences. For that reason, we must move slowly and carefully. But unlike these waters, time is running out. I'm George Lessons, TV 13 Eyewitness News.